Uh, my name is Kevin Simpson, as, as Michael pointed out. Um, I'm a liberal arts graduate. I studied government, East Asian studies, and studio art. I have no scientific background or knowledge. Everything you see here is pure amateur desire to see cool stuff. I did marry a theoretical mathematician, so that was my connection to science. Um, I, I do all the uh, arithmetic in our house. So, strangely enough, weirdly enough. Um, so, um, so this talk is about getting started with a Dobsonian reflector telescope. And um, I, I, I wanted to give this talk for a while because to me, this was a godsend purchase. It happened, I bought my telescope uh, two and a half years ago uh, in the throws. I ordered it in July and got it in late August of 2020 when COVID was really locked down. And uh, I bought it at, uh, at, the, um, at the urging of my friend Hanan Greenberg, who's a former board member and longtime stalwart of this club. Um, and he has the slightly bigger version of this baby. This is my first telescope. Um, the addiction quickly took hold. I now own five <laughs> telescopes. I do not recommend this. It's like when you get your first cocker spaniel from a rescue and then suddenly you have four. And it's kind of <laughs> the same thing. Um, what we're gonna do is, is just kind of talk through why I picked this telescope, what they're good for, what the basics of the design are, and I want this to be as interactive as possible. So as we go, we're gonna build my DOP telescope. We're gonna put it all together right here. And I'm gonna try and talk you through some of the things that I wish I had known, um, that I learned about along the way. I, was, I couldn't even meet somebody to show me how to collimate this thing, which I'll talk about what that is later. I mean, it was, you know, it was the time of the, of the, uh, the pandemic where people were crossing the street to avoid being near each other. Um, but what was nice was I had lots of time on my hands. Um, I had recently left my uh, place of employment to take a sabbatical, so I had a lot of time on my hands and I was able to teach myself a lot. And a lot of how I figured out how to do stuff, I've put into this very short 400 slide deck that we'll be going through um, at a brief clip. Um, the first thing I want to tell you is that I hope you'll ask questions. I hope you'll take a chance to actually look at everything that's here. Um, I may park your question till the end or till a later point in the presentation, but just throw your hand up in the air and ask away. Um, I did major in government, so the first thing they teach you is how to filibuster. So I will just talk as long as possible until I get what I want, which is for you all to leave happy. So, so let's start with resources for beginners. One of the best things that happened to me was I stumbled onto a book, and it's the first thing I'm going to li list up here, and it's called Turn Left at Orion. And this is my first copy of it, and you can tell it's been through the wars with me. Um, this is the best $35 that you'll spend as an amateur astronomer. And I'm going to pass a copy around for you all to just kind of thumb through. And what I want to tell you about this is you can buy it easily on Amazon. Um, make sure you get the latest edition, which is the fifth edition. Um, but look through this. It takes all of the top sites that are in the sky and organizes them seasonally, tells you what to expect in either a Dobsonian reflector or a, uh, a refractor telescope or even binoculars gives you an idea of where it's located so you can star hop to it if you don't have a go-to telescope. And also gives you lots of information about that object. This thing was pure gold because I took it up there to Crestview Park with me. I can't even observe at my house because it's too light polluted and I only have a narrow slice of the sky. So I spent practically all of 2020 in 2021 up at uh, Crestview Park in San Carlos by myself uh, with my telescope going through this book. And uh, if you look at the copy that I have here, I also used it as my observing journal. 
So the first time I saw an object, I wrote it down so I'd have a memory of when the first time I looked at the Orion Nebula or the M3 cluster or the core Coriolis um, double star. So I'll pass a copy of this around and just send it through the room and I'll put another one on the other side. And we're going to give away, I'm giving away two copies of this tonight uh, through the raffle. So hopefully some of you who are new to the hobby will be the winners of that. So that was, that's the first, that's the first thing. Some other resources that have been gold for me are these other items that I have up here. So the first one would be cloudynights.com. So I have another reference to that coming up. It's a website, it's free. If you register, you get a few more advantages on it. And it is the go-to place for amateur astronomers. And you can find all kinds of forums, how-to articles. There's an amazing classified section if you want to buy some equipment. And I spent a whole lot of time on this as I was getting started, looking for articles about um, how to collimate my telescope, what eyepieces I should buy, um, how to find different things. There's a great beginners forum, and I guarantee you if you log into that website tonight and go to the beginners forum, somewhere on the first page there will be a posting by a new person saying, what telescope should I buy? And there will be probably 10,000 of those. But you can just tap into a few of those and you'll find lots of suggestions. Or what eyepieces should I buy? So Cloudy Nights is my number two. Our website is great because it tells you the dates of our star parties. We put up a, a video and uh, slideshows of our previous lectures and we advertise our speakers. So it's a great way to learn about local astronomers and then YouTube is full, absolutely chock full of great and some not so great how-to videos. The company that makes my telescope, Orion, which is based down in um, Watsonville, California, and used to have a store right up here in Mountain View, um, they have some of the best how-to videos on how to use different parts of their equipment. So they have a YouTube channel. You'll find other YouTube channels there with everything from what is this object I'm looking at and, and why is this interesting to how do I collimate my telescope? So this was a godsend for me. And finally, everybody who is serious about this hobby should have the latest version of this book, The Backyard Astronomer's Guide. This is a big hardbound thing. I think it may also be in paper, but uh, I own a copy of it. And uh, there are some great getting started um, uh, articles in there as well as pretty in-depth coverage for a book that size on just about everything in the amateur astronomy world. So I spent a lot of time on this slide, but this to me is almost the heart of this presentation. Because if you don't have a telescope and you're thinking about buying one and you just want to get started, go now. Then you'll get plenty of great advice and there's lots of great resources there. $35 on Amazon. 35 bucks on Amazon for this book. It's, and I don't get a cut. Uh, these are two very well-known uh, well writers, and, and I guarantee you it's, it's just one of the best resources that you have. So that's what I'll say about that. Any questions on that one? Yes, sir. Yeah. Why is it called a Dobsonian? Well, we'll get to that. I, see that? That was me parking a question for later. All right, especially helpful, I've already gone over this, um, cloudynights.com and our website, I encourage you to bookmark those guys and put a like on, on your home screen and go there and you'll find all kinds of great stuff. Um, this is an example of the forums in Cloudy Night. I think this is a beginner's forum um, and uh, I'm not sure what telescope to buy. And there are three pages of responses where people walk the person through why they should do that. Uh, where should I start from? Um, I found this object. Is this a good buy? So all kinds of good, good, good stuff there. Okay. All right. So how to get started with the Dobsonian telescope. So out there in the world, there are a lot of kinds of telescopes. And the three most common that you'll see uh, are, are, are these three. And there, there's plenty more where that came from. But you've probably all seen one or two or three of these types of telescopes and maybe one other one. 
at our star parties if you've been there. So this guy over here is probably what most of us think of when someone says telescope. You know, it's long, and there's a lens at one end and a lens at another end, and you point it like a spyglass at an object in the sky. In the sky. This was the earliest form of telescope, and Galileo Galilei was the guy who actually pointed it at the sky rather than things on the ground. It's a refractor telescope, and it primarily works by bending light through a series of lenses and delivering that light to your eye. This is a reflector telescope, and this is very similar to the one we're going to set up and build here, and also similar to that little guy right there that Ed, our club member and board member Ed brought in to show us today. It works with mirrors down here, up here, and then finally there's lenses up here. And this is the type of telescope that Isaac Newton invented. He found that it was a lot easier to work with creating mirrors to gather light, focus that light in one central place, and give you a really bright view of objects in the sky. And then you see this base here. That's what we'll get to when we talk about what makes it a Dobsonian telescope and why that's special to those of us here in the Bay Area. And then here's this thing. Let's all practice pronouncing this. It sounds like something you need to take a lot of pills for. It is kind of a combination. And so I'm going to go to the next slide, which is one of those dreaded diagrams with beams of light coming in. So we talked about the refractor. So there's a big set of lenses up here. Sometimes there's another set of lenses here and a triplet refractor, another set of lenses down here. Maybe a mirror to make it more comfortable for you to watch, or to, to look through. Right there, a flat mirror that bounces it up so you can bend over right <coughs> and get down under here. That's a refractor telescope. A reflector telescope has a big dish-shaped mirror at one end. So in this telescope, there's a dish-shaped mirror at this end. And a flat oval mirror that that dish-shaped mirror focuses the light on. It in turn bounces it up through here where your eye goes and where there is an eyepiece, which is a set of lenses to add the final magnifying power and deliver that light <coughs> focus to your eye. So what the heck is this thing? Well, it's everything you could possibly think of and more thrown together in one stubby but powerful package. So you'll definitely probably see one of these at our starting parties if you come to. And they combine a lot of the benefits of each of these two types of telescopes into this hybrid. It's got a dish-shaped mirror, but it's got a kind of a lens up in the front here called a corrector plate that focuses the light and gathers it. And then there's another mirror here that reflects the light back down through a central tube that's a lot like a refractor. And then again, it bounces it all up. What's nice about these is you can get a lot of diameter without having a tremendously huge package to haul around. So when I unleash this beast, you're going to see that it's just about all the telescope that one aging person can handle. But this, while it may be kind of heavy, is stubbier and much easier to put in your average Mini Cooper, for example. So there's a lot of benefits to this design, and it's not something to sneeze at. It might also be a very good starter telescope. We hope to have a presentation later in the year that focuses on these guys. That's what okay. Ed has, isn't it? Pardon? Yeah, Ed has a monstrously huge one that we call the Beast. Yeah. And he's changed this front part, and he's rigged a, a camera, a very fancy camera, up here. So he's turned the thing into a, an electronic marble. So you should definitely go check that out when you go to the smart phrase. OK? Who, uh, who can say catadiotropic? <laughs> we blessedly call them cats. <laughs> So what's a Dobsonian reflector telescope? So there's a reflector telescope right there. This is the thing that makes it a Dob, a Dobsonian. So there was a gentleman by the name of John Dobson from San Francisco who, at a very young age, started building his own telescopes and kind of perfected or popularized this simple base that I'm just going to swipe through this slide. So again, the light comes in here, it travels down, hits the dish-shaped mirror, the primary mirror we call this. So you're going to want to start getting used to what you call these parts. 
So the primary mirror is the big dish-shaped mirror at this end. The secondary mirror is inside there. And in a second, I'll have you come up and look at all these things in this little guy here. And then you have an eyepiece, a set of lenses up here. So the light comes down through here, scattered and reflected through the fat, flat mirror here and set up through the eyepieces for final magnification, whatever that's going to be, and focusing. So what makes it a daub is you have this two-axis system for pointing the telescope where you want it to go. And it's a very simple and straightforward and very easy telescope to operate and very nice handy mount. And you can build them out of all different kinds of materials. Mine happens to be made out of commercial grade particle board. So I was drizzling out there and I covered it with a trash bag. This is the base of my Thapsonian telescope. And I'll just unveil it right now. Voila. Ooh. Please tip your, bartend your bartenders and waitresses, waiters. So I'm going to take it off the base. This weighs about 30 pounds for a 10 inch reflector telescope. And what makes it a daub is it swivels in two directions, right? There's a bearing underneath there made out of plastic that swivels it around this way to point it north, south, east, west. And then there are two hubs here, and my telescope has hubs, has hubs built into it that elevate it from zero straight ahead to 90 degrees straight overhead. And with this, I can see the entire dome of the sky. Um, and so that's called the altitude in azimuth. We have to find a complicated word uh, in order to keep you know, just casual people out. But azimuth, what direction am I pointing at? So this is an alt-az, altitude azimuth mount, but it's very simply constructed. Now, this one happens to be a non-electronic, non-motorized Alt Azitooth, Alt Azimuth, Dobsonian base, and mine happens to have motors. So I went in a little whole hog and bought one that has a go to device on it. And we're going to put it together and I'll actually operate it here, although I don't think we'll see much. Um, there's a motor here, elevates. There's a motor there, turns it around. So, um, and then I'll show you what I've added to it. It's a little skiddy on this floor here, so. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll check that out in a second. So any questions about the design of this telescope or why we call it a Dobsonian? So Isaac Newton invented the reflector, Dob invented the base, and he's the guy that gets all the credit. Everyone says, oh, you should get a Dob. Yes, sir. Um, you said it's about 30 pounds for that uh, base mount. What, what size telescope is that? That's a 10 inch. Yeah, so you'll see it. I'm going to unleash the beast here in just a moment. Okay. So what? Um, so here's the basics: reflector, optical tube, continuum, combination of two mirrors. Now, one thing I should point out is the reflector telescope could be mounted on a different kind of base, and you will see them out there where people put them on a tripod type mount, which might be alt azimuth as well. But it's not as simple as this very portable, very stable base. You start getting into a tripod, you start worried about being, things being tippy. The main reason why people might do that is to put it on a different kind of mount called an equatorial mount. And an equatorial mount is designed to rotate around the same spot in the sky that the Earth rotates around. If you think of a pole going out from the North Pole, there's a celestial North Pole. Our Earth is rotating around that, and therefore everything in the sky seems to rotate around that point. I'll show you a picture a little later that makes that make sense. Yes, sir. Kevin, you might want to mention how we describe the size of telescopes. You just said 10 inch. Yep. So generally, in telescopes, more aperture opening to allow light to come in is better. Because the more light you can get from a very distant object, the brighter it's going to be, and also the more detail you're going to be able to bring into focus. So I bought a 10-inch aperture Dobsonian reflector telescope, and that's what's sitting in what looks like a case for an atom bomb here. So this is my 10-inch telescope. I think this guy is probably, what, about a three? Maybe four? Yeah, that would make sense. 
maybe three, maybe four? Maybe yeah. three, maybe two and a half. Right. But it's the diameter of the mirror. Yes, the diameter of the mirror across the lines. Thank you. The diameter of the mirror is what makes the difference. And this is true also in refractors. So the bigger the objective or the aperture, the more light that you can get into that refractor and eventually get focused together to come up through your eyes. So um, anybody buying a telescope has almost always talked about the diameter of the aperture of the telescope at some point in the conversation. So thank you for pointing out that I admitted that. So here are the two guys. <coughs> Here's Isaac Newton, who actually invented the reflector telescope, and he takes second billing out of John Dobson. He was very famous for doing sidewalk astronomy. He would build these telescopes, take them out, park himself on a corner in the middle of the evening in San Francisco or wherever, and just coax people to come over and look at the moon. Here he is, set up, take a look at Jupiter. So I guarantee you most 95% of the people that walked by there who actually took a second to look through his telescope probably had never seen Jupiter with their own eyes. So he was a big proponent of taking the mystery out of this, building your own telescope if you have the means and wherewithal to do it. And, uh, and he was uh, very, uh, so many of our club members have met him. Are there any, is there anybody here who has met him? There was a gentleman at our last star party who met, who met John. He dubbed up this one, two, three, four. Great. Ken, our, our fellow board member and member, longtime member of our club, brought in this book, which is a great resource. If you wanted to build your own Dobsonian telescope, you could. And it's very common. There's a lot of people who are super passionate about this. I guarantee you this is a home-built telescope. You know, and you need things like plywood. The most complicated thing is coming up with the mirrors that you're going to use and grinding your own or purchasing them. You can go out and buy mirrors and mirror blanks and either grind it to your specifications or buy one that's already ground and silvered for you. So this book is all about that. Um, it happens to be written by uh, one of the authors is a guy who uh, runs a company called Obsession Telescopes, which are sort of this cult beloved uh, brand of uh, handcrafted uh, Dobsonian particular telescopes. So thanks, Ken, for bringing this in, and it's a great resource if this is something that you want to tackle. Um, at my age, it's not something I want to tackle. You know, uh, I, uh, I have a little bit of trouble operating the vegetable crispers in my telescope or in my refrigerator, so it's not not for me. Um, now, I would also like to point out that Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, this is what is now known as the Mike Cook hairdo. <laughs> so although he invented it, Michael Cook popularized it, and that's why that's just known as a Michael Cook. All right. <laughs> So there's the two guys. So we talked about, yes, sir. So what, when it, what might it cost to build your own? Of course, it's going to vary by the size. 30 bucks. Hmm. Wow, that's really? No. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> no, I have you no. Know, but a lot of the materials are pretty simple. This is simple industrial grade steel. The mirror. The two mirrors are the most expensive components that you can even buy those in a raw state and grind them down. Probably it costs a good bit less than what I paid for it. A lot of what I paid for in this telescope, more than half the cost is the motors, the software, and the computer that's in there to make it go where I want it to go with just a hand paddle. So they're relatively cost effective to build. And uh, I think the big trick is you already have the tools that you need to do it. But I'm sure in this book, uh, if Ken will let you uh, take a look at it, they give you some idea of the cost. So the, it's probably double what it was four years ago, yeah. uh, the way things have been going. Okay? So we talked about um, Dobsonian sizes. So generally when you make a bigger, you get a bigger mirror, you're going to get a bigger overall device in the Dobbs. Whereas with the cats, um, you can make this a little bit more compact. So I bought a 10, and that is really pretty much what I can carry. I bought a carrying case for it from Orion. I can sling that over my shoulder. This weighs about 30 pounds. That maybe weighs 35, maybe 40. I don't think it's really 40 pounds. I never try and move them together. As you're going to see, we're going to take this out of the bag and mount it on this in just a couple minutes. 
But if anyone wants to come up and try picking this guy up, uh, please feel free. It's, it's not that heavy. Uh, more reasonable ones, and the ones that people typically start with, are somewhere in the A6, even 5-inch range. And then you get these tabletop sizes, this being a rather small one, but there are some that are a little bit bigger than that. So this is a dot. It's the same concept, right? Rotates to the azimuth, rotates to the altitude to let you point at any place in the sky. Okay? Any questions on this? What went into your decision to buy a 10 inch? Um, because it, so if you think about it, this, because it's 10 inches and it's a circle, collects 40% more light than this. Whereas a 12 inch, and Hanan has a 12 inch go to Orion, the same brand as mine, uh, it's a beast. It really, he can handle it by himself. But getting it out of the back of his car, getting it to where he's going to observe with it, it's a lot. And I kind of knew that anything over this, it would start being a deterrent to my going out. So my advice is, before you go buy one of these, think about where am I going to observe? I knew that I probably wouldn't be able to do much from my driveway, where I can see about this much sky. Um, and the city decided in its wisdom to put in about 6,000 megawatt street lights a couple years ago. I can tan by them in my bedroom with all the blinds shut. Um, I knew that I was going to be going somewhere else, so I needed something that would break into a couple pieces and that I could carry. And, uh, and frankly, I got good advice. Hanan said, that's the one you want. You can really see a lot. Pardon? What about the upper ratio? The length of the telescope. The length of the telescope determines the F ratio, which tells you how, basically as a measurement, the lower that is, the more light you're picking up um, through the optics. And this was a 4.7, which is called fast. So if you think about it, it's similar to cameras, the same, the same uh, idea if you've got an F1.4 50 millimeter lens or an F1.8 or an F2.4, you're really getting brighter pictures when you get down there in those lower numbers. And so with a 10, I could get down to something like a 4.7 and uh, I knew that I'd be able to look at fairly distant faint objects with that. That being said, you know, I probably wouldn't be a sad person if I had bought one of these two. And Orion makes go-to, makes, and when they're in stock, offers go-to versions of these guys. I think this one and the 12 is what they offer now. But these are readily available out there on the market. So in the end, and price factored into it. When I bought this whole set, it was about $1,500. Uh, and the 12 was, uh, I think 1800 Now I know they're about $1,900, so they've gone up quite a bit when you're in stock. Yes, sir? I'm just going to mention, uh, if anybody, um, I, I don't know what the plan is for Jazz Under the Stars up on the rooftop observatory, but uh, when they uh, when they do feature it, they usually move out about four or five uh, Dobsonians of six and eight inch aperture, which yep. is a good way to get a feel for it. Yep. Not only how they, how they move, but how much you can see. We just yeah. did this past Saturday. Yeah. We have a bunch of people out there. Hungry. We take out four dobs. So another good resource is you know, Jazz Under the Stars. They bring out the dobs, and uh, the, the college has a, a good collection of them. And uh, Daryl here could probably give you some advice as to when you might be able to catch those. Lately, I haven't been seeing anybody but me and maybe a couple other people bring dobs. And uh, they tend, Hanan brings his, it's a 12. And uh, I have seen a six and an eight there on occasion, and we have a couple of people bringing somewhat smaller, much more compact backpack size. <coughs> so that's always a good piece of advice. Go to an event, check out the equipment, or ask around, see who's got one. Okay. All right, so uh, human to scale. Um, what are the benefits? Why, why did I pick this one? Well, it's a pretty common recommendation for first-time telescope buyers. Start with a dog. It's relatively inexpensive to gather a lot of light. You can get, uh, I believe, a six-inch dog for uh, non-motorized for about $3.99. And you're going to see a lot with that telescope. You can take it a lot of places. You can use it a lot of places. 
It doesn't require learning things like how to run an equatorial mount and how to track across the sky, which is a little bit more of a learning curve than simple, there's the thing, it's that high in the sky and it's that direction in the sky. Um, so it's a good, it's a good entry level, um, inexpensive way to gather a lot of light. People refer to them as light buckets. Um, it's great for visual observation. So if you're new to the hobby, and you're thinking about eventually getting into astrophotography, it's probably best to start with visual, learn the sky, learn what's out there, and these are great telescopes for that. It's versatile. I have seen all the things listed here with my dog with some level of detail, which is pretty tough. At 10 inches, I can see some galaxies, and I can make out that they're spiral galaxies. I've seen lots of really cool nebulae. Um, the Orion Nebula looks spectacular, planetary nebula look great in this. Um, it's dazzling with star clusters. And then for the moon, sun, and planets, there's almost nothing better. Now, I said the sun. You can look at the sun with a telescope. Never point your telescope at the sun unless you have a good quality sun filter on it. And I will never talk about using a telescope with the sun without telling you that because you will go blind if you point your telescope at the sun and you don't have a sun filter on it, okay? That's just my, I feel obligatorily that I need to tell you that. Even if you're testing your telescope and you got it out and you're putting it all together and you're excited because it just arrived, for the love of God, don't point it anywhere near the sun unless you have a sun filter on there, okay? All right, so they're simple to operate. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the two different coordinate systems for finding where something is in the sky, but as long as you know how high in the sky that object should be right now, and there's a magic trick to figure this out, and which direction it is, you can find it with a dot telescope. You know, you don't have to be kind of thinking about how things move through around this imaginary spot in the sky. Um, and they're widely available. There's dozens of manufacturers. You can find them in all different brands. Many of them are made by two manufacturers and sold through multiple brands. So they're very almost interchangeable out there. And you can find them, find them almost anywhere. So those are the kind of key benefits for a dot. Um, what's it not so good at? It's cumbersome at larger sizes. So you're going to see when this thing is set up, it's kind of an impressive beast. And it's a little bit much to to uh, carry and move. So if you think you're gonna need to move it around at night, uh, maybe this is not the best thing. Or if you wanna take it hiking, you're not gonna take that guy hiking. Um, it requires collimation. This is the scary thing that people, I actually saw a post on uh, Facebook from a group that I belong to where someone said, I'm thinking about buying a 10 inch Dobsonian that my son and I will use a lot, but I'm terrified of collimation. I figured out how to do it, and I'm not even great at backing out of my driveway. So you can figure this out. It does require you to do this from time to time, but it's not hard. It took me a little while when I was learning it in a vacuum watching YouTube videos, but once you get the hang of it, it becomes very simple. And it's not the best choice for astrophotography. It's great because it doesn't have any what we call chromatic aberration. So the lenses don't cause the light to split and give you these weird ghostly colors. So the, the images are nice and clean, but it's not as precise as an equatorial mount, especially with tracking for astrophotography. Although, <clears throat> I recently joined a Facebook group of uh, Dobsonian astrophotographers and they're doing some amazing things. And uh, I think it just requires a different level of uh, attention to detail. So it can be done, but it's not the choice that most people go to if they're going to do serious astrophotography. Okay? So it's primarily a visual instrument. Okay, any questions? Where to buy a telescope? So I bought mine from the manufacturer online and it was delivered to my house and the porch pirates did not get it. So mostly because the boxes were the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> so that is one of the best places to get something like this. If you're gonna buy new, I just listed six places you could buy telescopes of all different kinds. 
start with Orion because they offer a little bit of everything. You can browse through there. I happen to look at their telescope uh, webpage today. They're at telescope.com. Somehow they got that. They also now have a physical store again. They used to have one in Mountain View. They closed it during the pandemic, and I understand they've reopened it down in Watsonville at their uh, facility. Uh, so you can go down there and see all kinds of great stuff. They have great how-to videos on there, but it's also a very good vendor. I've had very good experience. I've bought a lot of stuff. You'll see a lot of Orion branded stuff here, and uh, I've had very good success with them. They do not do any support for people who buy Orion products secondhand. So just beware of that. You can't call up their tech support if you buy your telescope from the guy down the street. Unfortunately, it's a weird policy, but um, I don't know why you would cut off the secondary market to the people who bought telescopes from you in the first place. But it is a great place to buy not only telescopes, but accessories. Other vendors I've used, a Gina Astro, OPT Telescopes, B&H Photo Video has a good selection. You can buy them on Amazon, okay? I recommend before you order anything and get it out of the box and try putting it all together, at least get some experience. Come to our star parties, look and see what people are using. Go to other club star parties. Ask people on forums online. There's lots of Facebook groups and just uh, see if you can get somewhere and get your hands on the telescope and then make up your mind. But uh, it's, it's a great, uh, there's six or five great uh, places and there's, there's plenty more of these where that came from. Use. You can and probably will eventually buy some used telescope equipment and I have, I bought a 20 uh, year old, I bought the estate of a deceased astronomer um, a guy who was very passionate about it, and I bought from his daughter two really nice telescopes. Uh, and I, you know, I paid a good bit of money. One was a, a Takahashi refractor, and the other one was a Celestron C11, and a big lost Mandy mount, and a bunch of great uh, eyepieces. And I'm just teaching myself how to use those now. But I bought them used, and that was kind of a big risk because they, they if you never used anything before, you don't know what to look for. So I did a lot of research on this purchase, but you can do it. If you're going to do it, my first and biggest tip, tip is buy local. Find somebody that's within driving distance of you that's selling the thing you want to buy. Because the last thing you want is some scam or something to get damaged in transit that you've paid a lot of money for and have no recompense for. So Cloudy Nights and Astromark both have great classified sections. You can go there and you can uh, reg you have to register and pay a small fee, like 25 bucks or something, to use the Astromark uh, classifieds. Cloudy Nights is completely free. You just have to register and, uh, and you can go, I've, I've bought Plenty of plenty of things there, but uh, but unless it's a small thing, uh, definitely uh, try to buy local. Any questions about that? Unfortunately, there's not very many telescope stores anymore. Um, I last summer I was in uh, Michigan, uh, up near Traverse City, in a place called Leelanau, and a nearby small town has an amazing telescope store. I was shocked and went in there and uh, had, had a great afternoon. And wish this thing was on in the peninsula. What else do I need? So you buy your telescope and you think, I've got everything. The telescope is likely going to come with a couple of eyepieces, the lenses, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, it's probably going to come with uh, a couple of other little accessories, but you're quickly going to find you need other stuff. So there, you're going to need a spotter scope. So what's a spotter scope? This big guy looking through here and trying to find um, a tiny little galaxy um, is a little bit difficult. So the spotter scope helps you line up and find, uh, say, a star, and then do some star hopping, and then get to the place where you think that. This is a spotter scope. There's all different kinds of them. Uh, mine came with one that's called a red dot uh, finder scope. It basically is like a little telescope, but it puts a little glowing red dot, and you can use that to point at things get the telescope aligned, and then move it to the object that you want to see. I hated it. 
The first thing I did was spend another 45 bucks for a thing called a Telrad, which is in my uh, equipment case here, and which I'll show you, which actually gives you a little glowing red bullseye. And to me, it's just so much easier to use. A lot of people like a traditional, tall, kind of a tiny telescope that they mount up here to spot the, eye, spot the object you're looking for and guide the main scope to that object. Uh, usually there's much more magnification here and it's easier to see it in a wide field spotter scope. So that's the first thing that you may want to change out or think about changing up. Then there's eyepieces. We call them EPs. That's how most people refer to them. Um, and you're probably going to want a variety of additional eyepieces. For one, the things that come free with your telescope are probably pretty crappy. You'll get a kind of a powerful one and you'll get one that's wider field. And they're great to start out with just to kind of learn how the telescope goes. But almost like I said in that forum that had uh, the how-to in the beginner's forum, probably every single day there's a new thread of somebody going, what eyepieces should I buy? Um, and then the, the whole cavalcade of advice starts coming. I'll talk in another slide about what I picked and what you're going to want to think about getting, but you're probably going to want some eyepieces. Probably also one of the first things you should buy is a filter for the moon. Because if you look at the moon through a telescope, it, you could just spend all night doing that, and I often have, have done that. It's just remarkable what you can see. And uh, in order to not have your eyes get worn out and achy, you want about an 85% neutral density moon filter. It's about 20 bucks. It's a really good buy and you want to get it right away because when you're learning how to use your telescope, the moon is a great target. You can see it at different, uh, different magnifications, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and it's just a great way, and there's nothing better to dazzle your friends, neighbors, children, spouse, um, intended spouse, whatever, colleagues, than showing them the moon through a telescope. It's just eminently rewarding. So get a moon filter. Red flashlights. You're going to be out in the dark, and in order to see things well, you want your eyes to get dark adjusted, and that can take as much as 20 to 40 minutes. Turning on a bright red flashlight to find the page in the book that you want to go to will ruin that dark adjustment and you have to start from scratch. So I bought, I have probably 12 red flashlights of all different kinds. These are the ones that I mount just to keep people from walking into me. So I'll show you my favorite red flashlight in there and it's hanging around my neck and then uh, a lot of people get uh, a headlight of like this one. So that's my favorite and this is uh, another favorite headlamp that I use just to set things up in the dark, to change eyepieces, to find the page of my book, to adjust something in the dark. You're going to want red flashlights. And then finally, observer's chair. So there's a pair of them. I brought mine here. Why do you want this? If you're buying a Dobsonian of any kind of size, you're going to rotate from almost horizontal to very tall. And depending on how big your telescope is, that eyepiece may be at different heights. And you can get a chair that you can perch on that easily adjusts, that lets you comfortably sit at the eyepiece. You think you don't want to spend 150 bucks, that's what this costs, on a chair. You know, I'll just take one of my chairs from my house. Believe me, adjustability and comfort means you're going to want to sit there a lot longer than you would otherwise. So uh, I definitely, maybe it's not the first thing you buy, but as soon as you start going out, more and more often you're going to want something like this. A lot of people make them. If you're handy in the wood shop, there's lots of plans online. You can find them in cloudy nights and in other forums. But this is an observer's chair. Folds up very easily, and I can stick it in the back of my outback with all my other equipment. So those are kind of the essentials. Then beyond that, star charts, guidebooks, or apps for finding the things that you want to see, or what's in the sky tonight, what's on show. And finally, collimation tools, which I'll talk about once we start setting the telescope up. That dreaded collimation thing, I'm going to show you what makes it easy. Maybe we'll even collimate the telescope. Okay? Okay, eyepieces. Any questions about anything I've covered up to that point? No? Okay, so eyepieces. This is the thing that you'll probably invest the most in besides the telescope. And they come in a huge variety of manufacturers, uh, varieties, uh, types of eyepieces, the power that's involved. 
But there's some basic things to know about them, and I'm just going to swipe through. Here we go. Okay. So the first thing about it is every eyepiece has a millimeter rating, which is the focal length of that eyepiece. And what's weird about this is the bigger the number, the lower the power of the eyepiece. <coughs> so a six millimeter eyepiece is much more powerful than a 24 millimeter eyepiece. The other key number that's here is this thing. This is the barrel that sticks down into the focuser of the telescope. This is the focuser. It's got uh, a track that lets you, like a microscope almost, focus the object depending on the mirror and the distance and the eyepiece. So if you focus with the focuser, the eyepiece fits down inside that. This barrel is typically either one and a quarter inches or two inches. The telescope that you buy will have a focuser, and here's mine. It happens to have a two inch focuser with a 1.25 adapter. Almost all of the eyepieces I have are one and a quarter inch eyepieces and I fit them into the one and a quarter adapter. That's the most common size and it's the best bang for the buck in terms of the construction of the eyepiece. Now a lot of really fanatical, advanced um, astronomers like the bigger eyepiece types and there are a couple of two inch eyepieces that I have for specific purposes and I'll talk about, I'll show you one and I'll talk about them in just uh, a little bit. But uh, I can have either two inch or one and a quarter inch uh, eyepieces to go into my telescope so it's very versatile that way. Okay, so that's the basics. When you look at an eyepiece, you're talking about the focal length and the barrel. You should always be sure if you're gonna order something online that you're getting the right barrel size and that your telescope can accommodate it. There's probably more telescopes that only take a 1.25 than take a, only, a, you know, if you got a 2.0, there's plenty of adapters you can put to take a, a 1.25. You can't go the other way. Any questions about that? What's the advantage? Pardon? What? What's the advantage between the two barrel diameters. The two inch diameter you can get much more wide field type low power uh, eyepieces I believe is the primary advantage. You can also do much more complex things with the lenses that are inside that eyepiece. So they, they have a lot more they can do with a two inch uh, diameter uh, aperture I believe. But that's just what I conjecture. I haven't spent a lot of time uh, actually worrying about it too much. Any other questions? Uh, can I add something? Yes. In my experience, and it goes back quite a long ways, um, I have found that, well, uh, you probably already have heard that power is greatly overrated. Yeah. Uh, power is not the important thing to, to seek in a, an optical system. Uh, most of our observing is done at low power. 90% of what I look at is done at less than 100 power. Not to observe anymore, but. Uh, that, that's, uh, that works for most people. And a uh, longer focus eyepiece with a, with a you know, larger number is going to give you a brighter view, a wider field, uh, better eye relief, which means that you don't have to park your eyeball so close to the eyepiece in order to see. Um, and, uh, and greater comfort and ease of finding objects and staying on them. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So, uh, low power, however you achieve it, whether with a long focus inch and a quarter uh, uh, diameter tube or with a two inch, is uh, the, the low power is going to be your uh, most useful eyepiece combination and the one that probably gives you the most uh, pleasure and that you're able to share with others. Thank you. Well said. 60 years of experience. Three and a half years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I, if I may yes. interject, uh, probably the most commonly used eyepiece that you will use most often is around a 25 to 30 millimeter. And, uh, that's going to give you a nice intermediate size field of view. Uh, most of them are in one and a quarter inch format. There's a few of them in two inch format. Uh, either one would be fine. That's a that's a good place 
to, that's, the, that's probably the eyepiece that you would use most often. Um, it's uh, probably a good idea to get uh, one eyepiece that's uh, uh, a wider field, a short, in other words, a longer, fo uh, longer focal length, which is uh, say around uh, uh, 30 to 40 millimeters, and then maybe one other eyepiece that's a uh, shorter focal length, maybe around um, 15 to 10 millimeters. But the 25 to 30 range uh, you know, is the one you probably use most often. Uh, one more thing, if I could add. The, uh, the way that you figure the power is a focal I'm gonna length. Come is, I got it coming right over. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, power. So, people often, the first thing they say when they walk up to me in the park when I'm there by myself is, what power is this telescope? How much can it magnify? They mean, how big can you make something appear compared to what it would appear to your naked eye? Well, there's a formula for that, and it varies by telescope. Your telescope has a focal length. I happen to know that my telescope has a 1,200 millimeter focal length. I divide that by the focal length of the eyepiece, and I get the magnification. piece by one and a half to sometimes even three and they're relatively cost effective and they're a good way to get started so I have a Barlow I don't use it very often because I spoiled myself with eyepieces but if you're starting out on a budget the first thing you want to buy is a good Barlow at a reasonable cost and then you get six lenses instead of three for example. So, very good question. Thank you. The trade-off is that it changes the focal ratio. Yeah. So it makes an image that would be bright. Yes. Standard eyepiece 
very dark. Yeah, it, it can. Barlow. So it is also something where the quality of the Barlow is important too. So just like when you're buying eyepieces or your telescope, go out and get a lot of advice. Google the thing you're thinking about buying. Ask one of our members about what Barlow's they have and what their experience is with them, and they will tell you. It's a very timely question, actually. Okay, so this is my, this is not my whole eyepiece collection, but these are the guys that I'm using 98% of the time. Uh, I have three here that are kind of my go-to guys. This is where I used to find things very often. Then I go to more and more magnification. With this one, with nothing else in my telescope, I can get the full moon nearly filling the eyepiece when I look at it. These happen to be by a company called Explore Scientific. They're argon filled in the inside, which makes me feel good <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, this guy, I really get a lot of detail on deep space objects, and it's still very bright. These happen to be called, uh, these two happen to be their 82 degree field of view, which means it's a very nice, wide, uh, lovely eyepiece to look into. And I did, again, I went on Cloudy Nights, read probably 100 threads about eyepieces. These were a good buy. They're a little pricey right now, uh, but uh, the prices are starting to come back down. So these three I use every night. I use all three of these, these eyepieces, and you'll see they're right in my eyepiece. If it's a good night, and I'm looking at planets or small um, objects, I'll sometimes be able to use my four and a half. I've even got a three. I've probably had it out of the case five times, 10 times. The nights are usually not clear and still enough around here for us to be able to use that. Okay. Um, other popular sizes, as Ken mentioned, some of these, 31 is a very popular size, 13, 6, and 3 are other popular sizes around these. I don't know why I settled on these. Probably if I were doing it over again, I might adjust that up or down a little bit. But these really work really well with me in, in my telescope, in my opinion. Uh, the other guys may look to my telescope and say, I don't know what's the stupid <laughs> But, you know, I've only been doing it three and a half times. When you're at our star parties, ask, ask me what eyepiece have you got in there? What kind is it? How, what's the power? Then you kind of start building up a mental catalog of which experiences you enjoyed the most. And there's all kinds of other terminology and people go down the rabbit hole and talk about plossels and this and that and the other thing. And I can't tell you what a plossel is. I don't know. I don't really give a crap. I've got my eyepieces and they, they look good to me. And if you want to you learn that stuff, more power to you. Okay? Oh, here's, uh... What style are you, do you know what style yours are? are they uh, they're uh, they are light transmitting eyepieces. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. Maybe that's a shameful thing to admit, but no, I'm an amateur astronomer. Emphasis on the amateur. So, sometimes they say on the outside of the case. Oh, well, we'll find out here in a moment. I'm going to open the magic case, and you can come up and touch my eyepieces. Okay? So setting up the Dobsonian telescope. So you bought your Dob. You're very excited. It's broad daylight. You take it out in the driveway. You hope your neighbors will come by to show, so you can show them your prowess and skill at purchasing telescopes. And then you have to set the thing up. It's a pretty simple process, really. You set up and level the base. This thing needs to be level. Otherwise, you're not going to get where you want to get. So especially if it's a computerized go-to motorized telescope. So you notice that I have these eyepiece racks here. And I cleverly modified them by putting glow-in-the-dark tape on them so that I don't drop my $200 eyepieces on the ground when I'm trying to put them away while I'm looking at Jupiter. In here is a little bubble level, El Cheapo. This probably cost me a dollar. Um, I have a couple more expensive ones, but this one fits right here, and it's there when I take it out of the case. And I put it right there. And if you want to, we can now make this more interactive. Come on up here and look at this, because we're going to take this apart. Um, we're going to take this out of the bag, and we're going to start putting it together. So I put that there. 
and then I level this. I'll get little pieces of shim or something like a post-it note, a, layer, a couple layers of post-it notes. They're in my handy dandy bag and I'll level my eyepiece. The place where I observe most of the time is Crestview Park in San Carlos. And I found this magic spot that's level. And that's where I go every time. And when there's a star party, I get there early. So these other guys <laughs> don't end up in levels. I'm going to tell you. Well, see where I set my telescope, and you'll know. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to establish an endowment for that spot, so only I can use it. OK? Set up and level the base. So here's our Dobsonian base. Step two, install the optical tube. What's the optical tube? Anyone remember? It's the OTA. OTA, yeah. It's just the telescope without the mount. It's the telescope without the mount. This is the optical tube. So do you want to get up? Sure. Do you want to watch me install this baby? If you want a close-up view of this, now's the time. We're going to put my optical tube <laughs> Come on down. So, talk about good investments. Here's another $30 I spent. When you try and take this optical tube out, there are no handles on it when it comes from the store. It's just a big, long barrel. It's like an a steel watermelon that's four feet long. That's how handy it is to hold. I went to the Farpoint Astro, another really great vendor, and they have these beautiful straps that go around and Velcro. They've been on my telescope now for two years, and it makes taking my huge telescope out of the bag that easy. So here's the telescope. These guys right here are the two hubs. This is the altitude elevating hubs of the telescope. There's only mechanical objects in the optical tube. There's the mirrors and the rollers for the focuser, and there's the two hubs that it's mounted on. You see that big sort of thumb, thumb wheel screw there? That is the single screw that mounts this onto the base. So it's got this one little guy that I have to screw in, and it will be installed in the base. So I'm going to move this base in there. And if you want to come and take a look at the base, you'll see that there's a couple of rollers there on the right side as you face it from behind. Take a look on the inside of the right panel that moves up. You'll see a couple of rollers there. Yep, those are rollers. You can touch them and spin them. Okay. On the left side, there is the mount where that hub right there goes in, and that's what controls the motor that raises and lowers this to point it zero to 90 degrees in the sky. Okay, so all I'm going to do is bring it around over here and let it drop gently into the spot, and it's on. Okay? And then I just turn this, make sure it's seated properly, and I just turn that until it stops and I can feel it's going in. Sometimes when I set it there, it's a little bit, those, those two elevators are like this, so I have to kind of pick it up and drop it back in. So you want to make sure you do that so that it's secured very nicely, and this should turn and go all the way. Now when I bought my telescope, a little anecdote, when I bought my telescope, I could not for the life of me get that thing to screw in. And I looked at the hole, and there were no threads in it. <laughs> and I called Orion. It was, you know, the depths of the, uh, it was August of 2020, so you know what things were like. And I had waited weeks and weeks, and I could not mount this thing onto this. I couldn't securely mount it. I could set it there, but I couldn't screw it in. So I called them and they were super apologetic and they said they would send me this hub, which is a plastic piece, which is screwed on the inside of this telescope. So they did, they FedEx it was the next day. What I would have to do to install it would be to unscrew it by reaching my arm from here down to there, <laughs> unscrew it, take out 
the secondary mirror in the spider vein. This is a person who has never owned a telescope before. That would have been a bustle with a 12 inch. Yeah, the 12 inch you would have had to crawl inside of it. With, you know, somebody holding on to your feet. But I did it. Well, your arms were long enough. Yeah. While I had everything unscrewed, I looked at this mirror here, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and the big mirror down here, the primary and the secondary, and they both had enormous gashes on them. Oh, no. So I believe that the manufacturer in China sent Orion a defective second scope. Uh, they immediately made it good. They sent me an entirely new telescope. Uh, I had already put all this together. It came in like IKEA furniture, flat pack. This all, I put all together myself. Um, but they sent me an all new optical tube and uh, sent the other one back and their customer service was outstanding. Okay, so we did set up and level a base. We set it out and we leveled it. We installed the optical tube. So we installed it there, and I'm going to let you all come if you want. And you, if you want, you can do this. You can securely on there. Just feel what it's like to rotate that baby. Feel free. I know you have two finders. Uh, yeah, I'll explain that. Okay. <laughs> well, two eyes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, the one's for one personality and one's for my other personality. <laughs> okay? Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Now, in this floor, on this linoleum or whatever this is here, it's not turning, but you notice once we got a little weight on it, it turns this way and that way. You can operate this telescope completely manually, but it's a lot more fun and easier with the computers and the motors, okay? A manual only telescope would not have this motor here, would not have that motor there, and would have these springs here that kind of control the tension of how easily this elevates up and down. Okay. Was the motor an add-on or did it come? No, it came that way. There are kits that you can use to take a manual daub and add it on, but you know, I would rather somebody in the factory somewhere else. So did it come with the straps? No, I bought the straps. They were 30 bucks. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, it's great. And now, a smaller, I, anything from a six on up, I would get the straps. You can also probably use some kinds of luggage straps, but these have been foolproof. They have never once come loose on me, but uh, you can see they're very, very easy. Sometimes they get a little loose, and this one slides down the telescope. But, um, yeah, this is a cool telescope. What's that? You have straps for the school, school dogs? Yeah. Oh, no, no. We have eight inch uh, dogs, so they don't have to be Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they got a lot of students. They got a lot of students, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, no, no, no. If you want me to, I will unscrew it. If anyone wants to try hefting this and you want to test how much a 10 inch telescope weighs, I don't want to be the one that causes the straps to After two years. It is now completely loose. Does anyone want to try it? Okay. That's better than my fit cassock or any fork method. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to buy one. I'm just curious. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> oh, see, once you've held one, <laughs> you're going to want one. No, okay. It drops right in there. Yeah. So you notice when I was turning it manually, it was doing that? That's correct. Never when I've been out has that happened, because I'm usually on concrete a few times on the grass. The other thing I did is I went to Home Depot, I was a noted astronomical vendor, and got a carpet, an outdoor, big outdoor carpet mat, and put it down. Which offers the friction. Gives me just enough friction. Right. Inch, uh, now, when these get older, what's under here is a Teflon bearing that it's spinning on, or it's plastic or acetate or something. I've been told at some point I'll probably have to lubricate that, but I'm hoping that that's after I'm dead. Yeah, so a lot of people do replace those. 
you know, and you can order, there's a place called scopestuff.com that has all kinds of parts. And uh, they, I think they sell new acetate parts. And there are people who are these kind of craftsmen uh, fanatics about this hobby who that's what they make you know they make replacement acetate bearings that are 150 times better than the ones sold by the manufacturer so b believe me if, if you made some critical parts yeah this one here is actually yeah yeah but it uh, it's I it, I've never had a problem with it sticking at all okay so we've got the telescope installed um, now we need a spotting device, right? And Daryl asked why I had, I think Daryl asked this, right? Why do I have, these are brackets for the spotting scope. It's also elevated a little bit. The original spotter scope was just hugged right here. It was this thing called a red dot finder, which is a very simple little thing with like a AAA battery in it. And it puts a red dot in a little transparent thing. And you're supposed to look up the telescope yeah, and star hop that way. That is a pain in the neck. So I installed a riser, and I'm now going to come over here, and we'll move Ed's small dial over, and I will open up the magic case. Are you all ready? I made this case, so I ordered this online. It has flex foam on the inside, and this is the stuff when I'm using my dial, all this stuff comes with me. So come on over if you want to take a look. And here's all my magic stuff. So I carved all this stuff out. I recently, here's my big you know, level, right? This is a collimation tool called a laser. Here's my most popular eyepiece. And you notice that I have two of each of three sizes. I'll explain why in a minute. Okay? Here's a hand controller for the go-to. Here's my favorite red headlamp. Out. I can see what I'm doing. I can go to green if I'm feeling weird. <laughs> and there's also a white one when the end of the night I want to have I built this to my specs. This cost me about 100 bucks on conditionwood.com. I liked it because they had orange, and I could see that at night and not kick it over. And I, this was just completely intact, and you use an exacto knife to carve things out to your specs. So this is my spider scoop. It's called a Telrat. So this is it. It's got some batteries in here. And it is a World War II bomb site. This was invented to drop bombs during World War II. It's a Norton bombs. It's a Norton bomb site. Wow. So there's a window here and a hole here. It's, and inside there is our two AA batteries. Maybe it's a, it's a nine volt battery. And there is a little handle here. And it lights up a light inside there mm -hmm. and I'm going to pass this around and what you want to do is kind of line it up and look at something dark and you'll see a bullseye target in there. You see it? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that's nice because that can help me center and it doesn't obscure the thing I'm trying to figure out what's center. Okay? What's also cool about this is a lot of astronomy and it costs 45 bucks on Amazon. I've broken two and that's my third one. So this is to me the best. It's very light, very simple. There's like nothing inside there. I don't know why the box is so big. You can keep snacks in there. We can fit that on almost any telescope. I've seen people who have them taped to an EV scope. Okay. He's got it. Ed, that's the guy that has the tape. So where does that go? So it's going to go up there on one of those two brackets. And I'm going to install it now, if you'll let me. And then you can take a look at it from the telescope. I also, that the, you see the two poles sitting underneath it? 
that's a two inch riser. You can also get a four inch riser. The more riser you have, the less of this you're doing to find those things at night. So at first I had it mounted pretty flush with the telescope. We're kind of running out of time, aren't we? So why do you have two of everything? I'll explain in a minute. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Daryl, how soon will they throw us out of here? Well, I'm the no, one, you know, so. <laughs> We're, for a We're good for at least, at least quarters then. Okay, great. We'll try and speed this up. Okay? Now, before we go any further, I want you to look at the inside of the telescope. Okay? So this is the cap. It always amazes me of how loosely these things fit on here. It drives me nuts. I always feel like there should be a nice click, but there's no click. I put little reflector things on so I can find it with my headlamp in the dark. There's another modification I made to make myself feel better. Um, and I put the glow in the dark on the eyepiece racks. So that bomb sight goes here or here. I always put it on this outside one. And this is called a Vixen dovetail. And this is how you mount a lot of things on telescopes. So when we're ready, I'll install that. And you can look through it here. So this just slides right up in there, and it tightens down with one screw, and I now have my spotter scoop. Now, one of the first things, now, because this is a little bit floppy, can be a little bit floppy, one of the first things I do usually before it gets dark is I find a tree that's like at the other end of the park, and I look through here, and I look through here, and you can adjust where this thing is pointing with these three little screws that you see in the back yep. here. So you can line them up so what's centered here is also centered there. One of the best ways to do that is what we call is with what we call illuminated reticle eyepiece. And we'll later use this for the star alignment process. So what this is, is an eyepiece that has this little light up battery item, and it has a crosshairs, and I can use that to precisely align something in the center of my field of view. So I'm gonna put that in there right now, and this is the focuser. This is a 1.25 inch, one and a quarter inch barrel eyepiece, so it's got lenses. It happens to be a special one that has an illuminator here, and I put it in there and lock it into place and come on over here and you can see the beautiful red crosshairs. Mm -hmm. What's the story about the dead? Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I unpacked my telescope one night and there was a dent on it. <laughs> After, I, I, don't, I don't know what caused that. I actually went and took everything out which is a scary process, and pounded it with a rubber mallet to try and get, it doesn't seem to have affected the telescope performance at all. I mean, this is just cheap steel. This is what's important. Yeah, okay? Now, while we're up all up and around, uh, I'll maybe turn on all the lights. Does this turn the lights off? Yeah, where's, where are the lights off? No, 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 okay. So, now, while we're on there, I want you to look at a couple other things in the telescope. I want you to come over here and look down here. You'll be looking straight down the telescope past the secondary mirror to the primary mirror. So there's a 10 inch parabolic shaped, a parabolic shaped mirror. Stand directly in front of it. Oh, over here? Yeah. And you look straight, straight down here, and you're looking down the telescope to the 10 inch parabolic mirror here. Now, if I took that 10 inch mirror out, you probably wouldn't be able to perceive the dish shape to it. It's very, very shallow. But it's enough to take that light and concentrate it all up and send it right up here to the front of the telescope where there is another mirror, the secondary mirror. That mirror is oval and flat. And all it's doing is taking the light and sending it back up at 45 degree angle, back up to a 90 degree angle, up through the eyepiece where we're gonna look, okay? So this framework that holds that is called the spider. So it's, mine happens to have four straight legs. Um, and that's what is screwed into this base but that is the secondary mirror. Uh -huh. 
Okay, so primary, secondary, these are matched up so that they, uh, you can use them to um, reflect the light up to the eyepiece where you get extra magnification beyond what the telescope is doing natively. The secondary mirror has no magnification. Effect. No, it's Blood. simply it's sending the light. Direction. Right. Okay. Another question, Kevin? Again, you have two. So do you have another finder here? Yeah. Just alternate. So what I put in there. Like a right angle finder? Is a laser pointer. Oh. I have a green laser pointer that fits here. So when everyone comes up, oh. inevitably, I think I got it in backwards right now, but uh, I got this in backwards. Okay. This fits. Uh, this fits in here. Maybe I got the wrong bracket. This is new. Um, I get the idea. Yeah. So this fits inside here. And uh, I can fire a laser beam up to show people where this is pointing. So, but I broke the original one that I had, and I ordered a replacement. But I haven't moved it. Did you get that from Scope stuff? I got it from Orion. Orion. Okay. Yeah. But I broke the first one was plastic, and it broke. Yeah. yeah. And okay. then they made a metal one, and I think it's got. I think I've actually got the wrong. Okay. Okay. Just a cautionary uh, note on the laser pointers. Uh, you're not supposed to point them at airplanes yes. uh, as they are coming in for a landing. <laughs> yeah. So we're uh, taking off. And some people are going to end up paying large fines or going to jail. Or in the sheriff's helicopters that fly over. Or if anybody's on. Okay, so we have set up and leveled the base, installed the optical tube. You know, if I wanted to, I would point to something maybe a quarter mile away and make sure that this is pointing at the same thing as this. That way later on, especially when I'm doing an alignment to start the night for my computers, I know that I'm pointing at the object that I want, X star, whatever it is that I'm using to line everything up. And these two devices help me do that. So these are two alignment tools that I use, okay? The uh, crosshair pointer and my, um, my uh, Telrad finder. Collimate the mirrors, okay? So we talked about the 10 inch primary mirror here and the secondary flat mirror here. Now comes the part of the night that people dread when they own a Newtonian telescope or they're new to Newtonian telescopes. What is collimation? It's making sure that the two mirrors are perfectly aligned so that the center of the image is sent directly up to the center of the eyepiece. And therefore, everything is crisp, clear, and perfectly aligned. Um, and that's it's very important. This is all flexible. This is a mechanical, industrial device with not a whole lot going for it other than that. There's no electronics other than the computer that points it around. So making sure that that's lined up properly is very important. There's three sets of collimation, or there's two sets of three collimation screws. There's one set down here for the primary mirror. There's a screw that keeps it locked in place, and you unscrew that, and then these things tilt that mirror in three different directions. Um, and then up here, if you look at the front of this, so this is another tip. If you looked at where the spider was, and you may want to come around here and take a look at that, or I can point it at you and you can look at it. Take a look at the end of that. You see those three little thumb screws there? Mm -hmm. When I bought the telescope, those were three little Phillips head screws embedded in little holes on the inside. So it came with, yes, this screwdriver came with the telescope, and they expected me to come up here every night and hold this weighty little object and not drop it down the tube, destroying my mirror. And I said, that is not going to happen with me. And I read on cloudy nights, go to bobsknobs.com. Bob replaces, sends you a perfect set of little replacement screws that are thumb thumb screws that allow me to adjust the tilt without sticking this dangerous object into the mouth of my $1,500 telescope. <laughs> so fortunately, I've never had to do that. I suspect that the, I don't think that that's what actually caused the gashes on my original telescope. I think somebody dropped an eyepiece down here. It hit the primary mirror, bounced off, and then took out the secondary as well. But we'll talk about that later. So those are my two sets of three screws.
screws to tilt the mirrors to make them focus. So how do I do that? So I know these guys are all lined up theoretically. I unscrew this. I'm going to turn that guy off so I still have battery. Put him back. And I'm going to take out this guy. Okay. What this is, now I'm going to shortcut this a little bit because you can spend a lot of time on this. If you decide you're going to get a dob and you buy one and you're frustrated with collimation, you bring your dob to a star party and it'll walk you through the process, okay? This is a not very expensive laser collimator and it produces a laser light and you can see it. Um, it's not very powerful. Yes, there it is. Okay. This goes where an eyepiece goes. If I drop it right down in there, that is sending that laser down. It's bouncing off the 45 degree mirror, going down here to the 10 inch mirror. And I can look in here and take a look in there. What do you see? Go take a look. Somebody tell me what they see. It should be all the way around. There's no wrong answer. It should be all the way around, right? Oh, it's not enough. 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 Or you can yeah. have, use a three knobs to really smooth oh, cool. that oh, okay. light and right there. You see? Yeah. All the red lights are hard to see. Together for sure. <laughs> oh, I don't think the thing is in the light, light, right? right? It's like it's a three. Three. Yeah. Three. Yeah. Four. Four. Oh. Uh, some of you are seeing four, five red lights. Yeah. Your problem, One, you need to go see an ophthalmologist. <laughs> 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 it is not astronomically <laughs> related. <laughs> 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 not hit the bar before you come here. <laughs> right? you see multiple. There should only be one red dot in there. I only saw one. Yeah. Oh. Everyone see a red dot? Yeah. What else can you I tell me about that red dot? Well, if you're, it's it's awesome. It wasn't centered. How did you know it wasn't centered? Because it's a centering <laughs> point. Yes, there's a little thing that looks like a notebook paper reinforcer that's precisely centered, that it, the telescope came that way. Okay, that's yeah. called the centering hole or center mark. Most of them are that little round thing. Our goal is to adjust the tilt of the mirrors to get that little red dot right there. Okay, now the more elaborate, purest way to do this would have been to put a collimation cap, and there's one sitting in there somewhere, and look down through this and see how the reflection of the primary and the secondary look there. I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm not going to teach you to collimate a telescope tonight. I just want to show you how basically how the process works. I guess. You see it? Oh, I see a bolt. That's a bolt. A bolt? Yeah. Well, we're looking down at the mirror. Yeah. So did you all notice on my collimation laser there's this little oval cut right here yeah. with kind of a bullseye? Yeah. So yeah. when you collimate, you want to have the telescope raised a little bit as though you were observing because then everything in the telescope flexes a little bit and it's more realistic. Mm -hmm. And what I do is, the first thing I try to do is adjust the secondary by adjusting these knobs to bring that red dot as close into that center circle as I can. So I'm going to do that right now, and that's best done with my handy handy observer's chair. Are you sure about this? This thing is in the way, right? Yeah. Well, uh, it's, no, it's, it's bouncing right. off that mirror that's mounted there. You can stand back here, it might be here. Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. You've still not seen the red dots? I, 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 the thing is in the way. And if so you I stand can't. here, right? <laughs> yeah, look way back. You should be able to look around that thing and see a red dot on the mirror. Yeah. So all I'm going to do here is bring this bad boy around, and I'm just going to carefully adjust these little screws, and that is all I'm doing is turning these little screws. Once I get that red dot on that circle, or hopefully within it, it's close to column. 
Then the last thing I do is just carefully, carefully, I'm even turning it an eighth of a way around, tighten those up so they're snug so this thing doesn't jiggle, right? So now I've brought it as close as possible by adjusting this mirror. Now we're gonna finish the job with the same type of screws down here at the bottom. And the way that I do that is I look up here, and if you wanna really have some fun, come over here and get your head down and look at the bullseye on the laser collimator up there. Yeah, you didn't know you were gonna do like jazzercise so many times. Do you see it? You see, yeah. look up, up in here. We're very close to the center. So it's, it's roughly collimated. Now we're gonna fine tune it. And when I move those three screws at the bottom, adjust each of them to adjust the primary mirror, that's gonna put that red dot right in the center hole of that fine-tuned target. Now, any injuries you suffer are your own. Yes. Really you're doing this before it's I usually do this as it's getting dark, so I can see the dot. But it takes me like two minutes. It's not a big deal. I'm taking a lot of time with it because this is the most terrifying part of using a pen. If you haven't moved the telescope, then you don't probably don't have to keep calling. Yeah, you probably you you want to check it. Yeah. Right? Because if you're getting crappy views, it's possible. But this you'd have to do if you move. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the bigger the telescope, the more often the collimation goes out. Okay. So 10 and 12, you probably have to do it more than if you bought an 8 or a 6. And people tell me I never have to collimate. Is it temperature sensitive? It is probably a little bit because things swell. Yeah. Yeah. So you get on a real hot spell, maybe. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, one of the locking screw and the big guys are the actual adjustment screws. You sort of unlock it. Okay. okay, so I unlock this one, and I start turning this guy, and you can see that the dot is moving closer to the center of the hole. Yeah. Yeah. I move it a little bit more. Yeah. What if I have this for yeah. it? This one is moving in the other direction. Yeah. 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 This guy here. That's the direction I'm going to go. Almost there. And this guy should let me. Boom. When I see what looks like an eclipse, where that red dot is moved into that center hole, and I'm just past it, then I'm collimated. Boom, this is now collimated. And then so I carefully snug up these guys, and it's collimated. So you look up there, you don't, it's a little bit off. Tiny little off, but you can't see the red dot anymore. It looks like an eclipse. Yes. Right here. How do you know what you're doing is you're changing the angle, the optical angle? Of the so primary mirror. What happens if it's translated? Yeah. 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 Of the viewfinder or, or the eyepiece. Right. So if I'm truing everything to where I want the light to come out, then I have to be good. It, it, this was a leap of faith for me. I always felt like there's something else I don't understand. For one thing, I don't know why the hell they always use three screws. That always seems weird to me. I feel like up, down, left, right would be the right way to do it, but you know, I'm a liberal arts grad. So, yes, yeah. see, there's engineers and people who know things. And I'm always like, this is like a tripod. A tripod, you yeah. put three feet down, it's always flat. They, they, only need, uh, they only need two for you, so. Just like, yeah, that's true. Just, just like you said, okay. up, down, left, right. All right, so we've got it collimated. So the next thing is putting in a low to medium power eyepiece and find some guide stars, right? So if I didn't have a computerized, and we're running out of time, a computerized job, this is where I would bust out my 24 millimeter eyepiece. 
take out my laser collimator, turn it off so I still have a battery next time. Uh, Put in my eyepiece, and then this is what focuses the eyepiece, okay? So at this point, I could start looking for things in the sky, you know, star hop using this, using the instructions that are in turn left at Orion, or whatever the case may be, um, or star charts, or whatever, you know, the best astronomical tool that's free is an app. Stellarium is the one I like to use. And you point it at the sky and it shows you what's up there, or you can search for an object, click on that object, and it will tell you where that is right now. Okay? Now I covered this in a couple other slides up here, but um, we talked through collimation, finding things. So we talked about um, two grid systems. So I use Stellarium to click on the star Pollux, and you notice that I have two different kinds of grids. This is an alt-azimuth grid, and there's an alt-azimuth location right here in Stellarium to tell me where that is. It's 270 degrees north-south, which is basically due west. It's 49.15 degrees. It's about halfway up the sky. That's the easiest way to find something unless you're using an equatorial map. You can switch Stellarium around to give you the RA deck system, which is a different system for telling where something in the sky is. For all deep space objects, they have one RA deck address. And as the sky appears to move because the Earth is rotating, those things will stay fixed relative to everything else. But they, so you can always find them, you just have to know where that alt, or that RA and deck is, is the best way for me to explain it. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Right, but the sky, but that grid system is moving as the Earth rotates. And so you see these grids are pointing toward the imaginary point in the sky where the North Pole around which we rotate points at. So for a Dobb telescope, uh, Alt-Azimuth is the best system for finding something. So this Stellarium app, which is free, or you can pay 10 bucks for the more advanced version of it, will tell you where anything is. You can type it in a box and it will tell you where that thing is. You can use Turn Left at Orion to organize the first year of your observations. It even rates what's the best objects to see from January through March, from uh, April through June. So it's a really great resource, and you use Stellarium, and you can start star hopping. How does my computerized system work? After I've done everything I've done, I install this handpiece, which is called a SynScan. There's a computer inside my telescope. I plug in a power unit. This is my power unit. I've got a cable. I turn it on, and I do just a few simple things to line it up. I, I make it flat, so I look here to make sure that I'm level. I'm pointing at zero degrees altitude. I make sure it's pointing due north, so you need a compass. So I have a compass app on my phone. Yeah, I will lay it right here. Due north. Uh, no, north. yeah, no, not due north on the map. Uh, celestial north. Okay. And there's a setting in the compass app that comes with your phone where you can adjust that and say, show me magnetic or celestial north instead of due north. So I put my phone here. Oops. It's now pointing due north, it's level, I turn it on, and I go through a couple of little menus here and say, I'm at this location, my compass is telling me where I am in the world, I'm at 37 degrees, 32 minutes north, 122 degrees, 20 minutes west, I make sure that's entered in here. Usually it remembers the last place I was, which is almost always Crestview Park. Then I tell it the date, the time, the time zone, whether it's daylight savings time, how high in the air I am, 
And then I, it says, do you want to do an alignment? And I say yes. And it says, okay, do you want to do a two-star alignment, a three-star alignment? Do you want to stand on your head and say the ABCs backwards? I always pick two-star alignment. And it says, okay, find one of these stars. I scroll through till I find a star that I recognize, usually something like Arcturus. I then use the electronic paddle to control this. It'll say, find Arcturus, this is where it should be. I point the telescope at Arcturus. I put my crosshair eyepiece back in. Once Arcturus is in the middle, I hit go. It then says, okay, now I'm gonna find Spica or Vega or whatever's in the sky. It goes, I pick it, it goes and finds Vega. As soon as I get it, fine tune. So both those stars came up dead center in the scope. It says, okay, I'm aligned. Then I have little buttons to say, I wanna look at a planet, I wanna look at Venus. I press a button, this thing swings around, gets close to Venus. I look through here and say, hey, it's not quite centered. I get it centered, and then I start putting in more powerful eyepieces. Okay? And so that's how the go to function. And at that point, it's tracking. So it knows that if I selected a deep space object, it's going to follow that speed that that thing is going to move through the sky as we turn. If it's the moon, it's gonna move at a slightly different rate. If it happened to be the sun and I was crazy and it was during the day and I made sure I had a filter and I wasn't looking at the sun with my naked eyes, it would follow the sun's rate of moving through the sky. So that's the beauty of a go-to telescope is it has a catalog of 40,000 objects. I use a little hand controller. This is 20-year-old technology. Probably the software hasn't been updated in 15 years. And I can find all those 40,000. I worked my way through almost the entire Turn Left at Orion catalog using what you see here. And I got to see all those objects in my first year and a half. So this was a really good investment for me as a first scope. I now have five. I still use this and my EV scope more often than anything else. So if you want to take a couple seconds before I clean up and come and look at why do I have two of each of three of my eyepieces, my most favorite, 24, 14, and 20. Because the next thing I bought, and this costs as much as the whole telescope, it's called a bino viewer. It takes two eyepieces and installs here where the eyepieces go. And I look through two eyepieces it adds 70% magnification, so it's like a Barlow. And it gives me a slight 3D view. So when you look through the moon in this Bino viewer, at 8.8, .8, you're getting an incredible magnification on the moon, and you're kind of, it's tricking your brain into thinking that it's in 3D. And I love this thing. So it fits right down in there like that. I stick a couple of eyepieces in there. And at start parties, you'll often see me using the Bino Viewer, especially if we've got planets, if we've got star clusters, or if we happen to have the moon, because it's just a luscious viewing experience. So uh, uh, it costs as much as the whole telescope, but it was still pretty affordable. OK? So those are my eyepieces. What else do I got? Sorry, I'm really prevailing on it. So finding things, I talk a little bit in this presentation. So good habits. Number one, establish a routine. I'm not the most organized or predictable person in the world, but when I got into this hobby, I got very organized. I built my case. I put things in a precise order. I make sure they all go back in that case. That's my checklist that I didn't leave anything behind. If it ain't in this case, I've probably left it at Crestview. So I unfortunately haven't left this, but I've left a few of these guys up there glued. You know, they're magnetic, so they stick to the poles. Um, I haven't left any eyepieces, fortunately. But uh, get organized and have a routine. Follow the same checklist. So if you come to a star party and I seem a little terse or untalkative when I'm setting this all up, is it's because I'm going through my checklist. And that's not easy. I'm not an organized person. So, um, so uh, that's my best advice. Get yourself a gear case. It's so much easier than just grabbing all that stuff that's in a bag or a backpack or three bags, which is how I started out. 
Uh, pretty soon I went and bought myself this hefty foam. I even have another one that's more for my um, UV scope. Um, but, but everything fits here, everything is in one case, and I know that I have it with me. So uh, those are those are my 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 best suggestions. There's my gear case. Specific recommendations. Pick a first scope that can grow with you. Don't go with just the smallest right off the bat because you probably will outgrow it in a year. The sweet spot for a lot of people seems to be a six to eight inch dollar. Okay, now maybe that's out of your budget. You can start with a smaller one and maybe trade up down the road somewhere. Uh, buy new or local used. Don't send your money to somebody in Florida and expect to have a smooth transaction or New Hampshire or France. Use Turn Off that Orion. It really, honest to God, made me stick with this hobby. If I hadn't had this, I can't imagine whether I'd still be doing this, um, especially in the depths of uh, haunt the cloudy nights forums. They're full of great information. Sometimes you have to plow through a lot of stuff. There's also huge fights that break out. There's a young guy, there's a young guy named Augustus on there who built, he's 21 or something, and has built like 15 of these. Uh, he's a very aggressive amateur. He's a big believer in the Dobsonian movement of sky, sidewalk astronomy. He hates the EV scope. <laughs> like goes on these like Inquisition style rampages. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see some of that. It's always fun. Um, and then bring your telescope to our star parties. Come to our star parties. It's a great pile of resources and great wealth of experienced people who are passionate about the hobby and really want you to enjoy it. So I hope you uh, have great success if you decide to buy a job or decide to buy something else. And please come to it. These are my little star party buddies. That's William and Miha. And uh, they love to come. He's wearing an eye patch. Why do you think he's wearing an eye patch? It's so easier to see through the telescope. It's already the adaptation. I'm surprised nobody guessed a laser accident. No, <laughs> uh, that's exactly right. I, I, gave, I had an eye patch for the little kids because they find it easier to look through the telescope. The other thing that I recommend if you have young ones coming is buy this $15 footstool, the kitty stool. It makes it a lot easier to look in this telescope when it's way up there. Um, chair. <laughs> what else? Any other questions? I just want to comment that I have the same battery for my telescopes at home. That works super really well. It never seems to run out of juice. Right. Like I'm on, I've used this ten times since the last time I charged it, and I'm still it's at eight percent. So That's so good. Get that for my Tesla.